This week, Johnny Robot tears the fabric of time itself with a look at Quantum Break. Mike goes sorting through his video game shoebox and dusts off a copy of Mortal Kombat, and we spend a little time going very, very fast as we play Trackmania Turbo. This is Player Attack. Hi, I'm Jessica Citizen, and this week saw a resolution to the long, drawn-out court case between Valve and the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, and the judge has not sided with the gaming company. Instead, it's been found that Valve Corporation has engaged in misleading or deceptive conduct through Steam by making false or misleading representations to Aussie consumers about refunds and guarantees. Long story short, Valve argued that it was not actually conducting business in Australia, and it did not need to offer refunds via Steam. The ACCC and the court argued that by selling games to Australians, Valve was conducting business down under and by denying refunds was breaching Australian consumer law. In the 18 months since the court case started, Valve has started offering refunds, but it may still be liable to pay not only its own legal costs, but potentially up to 75% of the ACCC's as well. And sticking with Australia, the world of tanks has just gained a new resident as Wargaming rolls out the Australian cruiser tank Mark I. Better known as the Sentinel, this was the first and only Australian tank to enter mass production, but it never actually saw any action. By the time it was ready for the battlefield, the Australian armed forces had already been supplied with British and American tanks, so the Sentinel was never much more than a novelty. But now it's a novelty that you can drive. Be quick, the Australian cruiser tank is only available until May 1st, and then, just like the real thing, it'll be gone. And skipping to another very different world, World of Warcraft is not only hitting the silver screen later this year, but Blizzard has teamed up with Scholastic to turn it into a children's book. World of Warcraft Traveller features full-page sketches from Blizzard artist Samwise Didier and tells the story of 12-year-old Aramar Thorn as he discovers the mysteries and majesty of the world of Azeroth. So the protagonist of Traveller is a kid named Aram. And to put it simply, he's the son of one of the world's greatest explorers. And through you know, a series of unfortunate events, he, he washes up on the shore at the far end of the world. Um, and ultimately, um, with some of the lessons that dad taught him in a magic compass, Aram's got to find his way home. It's due out around the world in November with a sequel already on the way by Christmas 2017. In other news, industry veteran John Carmack, the man who helped create id Software and who is currently Chief Technology Officer at Oculus VR, has been named as the 2016 recipient of the BAFTA Fellowship. Awarded each year, the fellowship is the highest accolade handed out by the British Academy of Film and Television Arts, recognising outstanding and exceptional contribution to film, games or television. In previous years, the Fellowship Award has been granted to luminaries including David Brabin, Gabe Newell, Peter Molyneux, Shigeru Miyamoto, Nolan Bushnell, Will Wright, and in 2014, the whole of Rockstar Games. And speaking of Rockstar, Red Dead Redemption is still not available for Xbox One through backward compatibility, but a whole stack of other games are. Over the past couple of weeks, we've seen games as varied as Soul Calibur 2 HD, Halo Wars, Left 4 Dead 2, Dead Space, and Saints Row 4 added to the service, bringing the number of Xbox 360 games you can play on the Xbox One up to more than 150. That's not too bad for a service that was announced less than a year ago. Something that was announced far longer ago than that is Final Fantasy XV, which we first heard about all the way back in 2006, when it was known as Final Fantasy Vs. XIII. In the 10 years since, it's been renamed and brought under the official Final Fantasy banner and re-revealed as a sort of boys-only road trip. And this week, we finally found out when we'll be able to get our hands on it. At an event called Uncovered, we learned all sorts of things. There's a free standalone spin-off called Platinum Demo that you can download right now, featuring a young version of Noctis, as well as some battle gameplay and a drivable car. It is new content, but it will unlock free DLC for Final Fantasy XV. There's also a new tie-in anime series, Brotherhood Final Fantasy, which tells the backstory of the four main characters. Episode one of that is also available now with four more on the way. Even more exciting though is the feature length CGI movie named Kingsglaive. It's been in the works for three years now and stars Game of Thrones favorites Lena Headey and Sean Bean, as well as Aaron Paul, who was in both Breaking Bad and the Need for Speed movie.
and that all important release date for Final Fantasy XV, September 30, just like the leaks said it would be. In hardware news, there is a persistent story during the rounds that there is a new PlayStation on the way. Named either the PlayStation 4.5 or the PlayStation 4K, the console will, surprise, boast 4K compatibilities, with a more powerful GPU running an upgraded version of AMD's APU technology from the PS4. That means, rather than playing games at the current standard maximum resolution of 1920x1080, you could be playing at 1496x2160, if there are games that support it, anyway. This report has been backed up by a few different sources who were apparently chatting about the new hardware at GDC in early March. The new APU could also move from the current 28nm chip to either a 14 or a 16, bringing it in line with current industry standards. And quickly, if you rushed out and pre-ordered an Oculus Rift VR headset, you are officially part of the problem. The hardware started shipping on March 28, but many customers are yet to see their new gadgets. Oculus has admitted that due to the ridiculously high number of orders received on day one, the factory building the headset has experienced a component shortage. The bad news, obviously, your Rift is still a little way off. Instead of March 28, the new date is estimated as April 12. The good news, orders placed before April 2nd will receive free shipping as an apology from the manufacturer. And finally this week, movie news of a slightly different kind. There's another Resident Evil film on the way, but it's not starring Mila Jovovich. Instead, Resident Evil Vendetta is a CGI project focusing on Leon S. Kennedy and following on from 2008's Degeneration and 2012's Damnation. This one was announced in a rather unusual way. It was officially unveiled at the Tokyo Motorcycle Show, where it was also revealed that Leon will spend part of the movie astride the new Ducati XDFL. Vendetta is set to hit Japanese cinemas in 2017, and we will keep you posted about an international release date. For more information on any of these stories, or to keep up to date with the latest gaming news, head to playerattack.com. But for now, stick around, We've got plenty more still to come. killer is time. It destroys us all. When Paul came back, he took away the only person who could stop the end of time. My brother, Will. The thing is, when time broke and changed Paul, it changed me too. Quantum Break is the newest outing from one of my favorite long-time developers, Remedy Entertainment. Now, in the most ham-fisted simile ever, Quantum Break is much like quantum physics. Its existence confuses me. Slated as a game TV show hybrid, Quantum Break is a bizarre chimera on paper alone, but how well does it work in practice? Well, let's start with the premise. Quantum Break pops you in the fashionable shoes of Jack Joyce, part-time Sean Ashmore double and full-time disappointing sibling, who unwittingly becomes part of a time travel experiment that goes, well, just about as well as you expect. According to the time-honored laws of sci-fi screenwriting, Jack and former childhood friend Littlefinger, or as the game likes to call him Serene, gain the power of time manipulation, and undoubtedly some never before seen cancers. But wait, there's more. Time is also broken. From here the plot gets fully underway, with the interesting conflicted badass doing everything he can to stop our bland blank slate of a protagonist from saving the world. High concept art, this is not, with the narrative being closer to the butterfly effect than, say, Primer. But don't misconstrue that as meaning bad. It's fun in a sci-fi channel original kind of way, with the grunt of the story being conveyed by the 20 minute episodes at the end of chapters, which also just happen to focus on the far more interesting bad guys. Here you have actors like Lance Henrik, Marshall Ullman, and Aidan Gillian just hamming it up, and it's genuinely fun to watch. It's a shame to say that this enthusiasm doesn't transfer to the in-game narrative segments though which focus on our protagonist and his quest to be constantly surprised by the smallest of plot reveals. I don't want to lump this all exclusively on Ashmore, as I feel it has more to do with Jack being a basically character with no discernible traits or personality. The whole time I wanted to be serene. That dude was cool, that dude had drive, he had purpose, he had more than two emotions. But alas, that my friends is the curse of the identifiable player avatar. Here also seems like a good point to rap about pacing. It's bad. Quantum Break strives to be a narrative experience first and foremost, and in doing so commits the number one video game no-no, making the player as passive as possible. It has an outer frame narrative, where you just watch the show, 
Then it has an inner frame narrative, where you interact with the environment as little as possible and walk so slowly. And then there's the actual gameplay, which you get to actually push buttons and everything. 80% of the experience is passive. Who thought that was a good idea? Okay, as for the actual gameplay, it's perfectly possible. It's your average third-person cover shooter bolstered by time warping abilities. Not the dance, more like generic combat things like dashing, freezing enemies in place, and creating shields. All in all, there's about seven abilities, and I think I only ever really relied on one, maybe two. Why? Because they're not very well integrated. Look at past Remedy titles. Max Payne and Alan Wake had one core mechanic each, bullet dodging and light, respectively. They worked these mechanics into the gameplay until it was second nature. You had to use them. You wanted to use them. Quantum Break, you can simply shoot your way through. Some specific enemies require you to remember, oh shit, I can mess with time. But other than that, you can just gears of war it up and shoot until the cows come home. I have to highlight one of the standout mechanics at play in the gunfights though, the AI. These tricky devils will do everything they can to force you out of cover. Grenades, flanking, hurtful words, it's all used to put you on the back foot and force an offensive engagement. This only became more prevalent when they started using the same bomb funk freestyler abilities that you have, which force you to manage the combat space that much more. As much as it seems like I've done nothing but rag on Quantum Break, I want to make something unequivocally clear. It's not a bad game. It's fine. Hell, I'd go as far as saying it's good. It's just not amazing. And that's something I've come to expect from Remedy games. I feel the major issue here is the forced medium hybridization, as it does nothing but kill the pacing and take time away from actually playing the game. In that sense too, I can't help but feel the show segments would have been better off being released as an in-tandem supplementary viewing, thing much like Halo Forward Unto Dawn was. Regardless, the developers made a bold new move, and for better or worse, it was an admirable endeavor if nothing else. Come with me. We can survive this together. Give me the device. Don't do it, don't! What if you're wrong? No! unfamiliar with the Trackmania series, the best way to describe it is that it takes the precise, technical, high-speed gameplay from, say, the Dirt Rally series, and it smushes it together with the eclectic, balls-out course design and aesthetic of Trials Fusion. Trackmania Turbo is the latest in the series, and it's a time attack driving game where the only car that is ever actually on the track is yours. And when we say high speed, we mean high speed. You'll be able to complete many of the driving challenges in just a few seconds, but you will only be able to do it successfully after you've become intimately familiar with the intricate twists and turns that each track has to offer by failing spectacularly time and time again. The lack of any other real cars on the track really puts the emphasis on you. Each of the four play sets has a matching car. There's no personalization, tuning or tweaking. Any mistakes that are made are all your fault. No complaining that someone else has a better car than you. If you have a slow time on the track, you simply have to get better at it. The playsets also have their own visual style, which carries over to the driving techniques required. Canyon, Valley, Stadium and Lagoon all look and play very differently, which is great, all up until you spend an hour carefully perfecting your approach to one and then change to another map and have to completely relearn how to drive. Challenges vary from rough and tumble rallies to all out don't stop for nothing, driving up the walls and in between pillars with an inch on either side at incredible speed sort of reason. It might take you a few attempts, well, a few dozen attempts, but nothing beats the feeling once you successfully complete a challenge, until you realize that you only earn the brawl. The controls are perfectly tight and respond well at a lovely 60 frames per second on PS4. The physics on some of the crazy fast courses can feel a little bit out of your control sometimes at first as your car momentarily leaves the tarmac, which means you lose traction and control and your mind. A tip for new players, feathering off the acceleration slightly at these points in the course can help, just so you know. Oh. 
On top of all this, Trackmania Turbo is not a solitary affair. There's some good old-fashioned split-screen multiplayer thrown in as well, a welcome addition to a console generation that seems to have forgotten how or why to do it. Just like the single player, collisions are impossible, so you don't have to worry about your relevant partner or buddies ruining your chances at a personal best time. You're all just ghosts racing around a track. It might take a few tries before you stop flinching when your opponent takes a corner a little wider than expected right into your racing line, but once you're accustomed to it, the lack of crashes adds a certain intensity to the game. There's also online multiplayer, again with zero collisions, which is a blessing as some levels host up to 100 players. It really is a sight to see when 99 other racers completely mess up a jump in the same way you did and all their cars bounce away in different directions with the physics having their fun with the foolish souls that thought they were above the laws of racing. However, online rooms can only have a certain number of tracks associated with them, so they can't pick randomly from the pre-made 200 tracks on offer so things can get a little restricted. And if that 200 tracks aren't enough for you, why not make your own? There is a random track generator that fills in the gaps after you determine length and difficulty, but the real fun and longevity of this game comes from the twisted minds of those that craft the craziest, most death-defying challenges. There are a variety of tools available ranging from easy creation for those who just want to mess around and create a track, to advanced, which is where all the tools are available and your imagination is the only limit. There's already some great stuff online. Do you reckon you can do better? This is not a game for sore losers. It's not a game for rage quitters. If you fit in either of those categories, maybe try the demo available now on console to see if it works for you and don't blame us if it doesn't. On the other hand, if you're a perfectionist who takes great satisfaction from overcoming endless challenges, then skip the demo and just grab this one straight out. Trackmania Turbo is a fast, furious, ferocious, occasionally unforgiving bastard of a time attack driving game. And it's one other F word too. Fun. Mario vs Sonic, Jordan vs Bird, Birds vs Piggies, Ryu vs Ken, Spy vs Spy. There have been so many rivalries in video games over the past few decades that it's almost a ridiculous task to list them, let alone rank them. But one rivalry that has withstood the test of time is Scorpion vs Sub-Zero, the yellow and blue, fire and ice ninja of Midway Games 1992 classic Mortal Kombat. Welcome to the Video Game Shoebox. Released to critical acclaim and some news controversy regarding its violence, Mortal Kombat immediately became such a roaring success that in 1995 it was brought to the big screen. A movie which mostly kept the plot of the first game in which Liu Kang, Johnny Cage, Sonya Blade and the Highlander have to defend the realm of Earth from rival dimension Outworld. With some good special effects for the time and impressive fight choreography, it remains a cult hit to this day. It didn't hurt its chances that it had a pretty great techno soundtrack too. If you wanted a reliable time capsule for media in 1995, Mortal Kombat the movie is probably it. The game itself is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game with a unique five-button control scheme featuring highs and lows for punches, kicks, and a block. What made the game stand apart from others at the time was its look. The characters fighting on screen were all digitized versions of actors. Well, most of them anyway. This helped the game stand out and lent a sense of quality to it. I distinctly remember having arguments with friends at school about how video games would simply never be able to look better. They're real! The fighters are made using real people, I would shout. You can't make anything look more real than real. It's the best looking game ever. I was an idiot. The series would go on to become more violent with each new title the team at Midway would create, but many of the themes and character traits that are still present in this series all come from this first game. 
Sub-Zero still freezes people, Liu Kang still has a fireball attack, Johnny K still has his weird shadow kick thing, the Highlander, I mean Raiden, still executes his enemies, and Scorpion still chucks a spear at his enemy's chest with a rope attached to yank him towards him. No Mortal Kombat the movie, he doesn't have a weird pointy mouth spear creature of seemingly infinite left living in his arm. Nice try though. Get over here! Fatalities, ridiculous moves you could end a match with and of course your opponent's life, which this series became known a lot more for with Mortal Kombat 2 and onward, are actually present in the first game as well. Although if you played the Super Nintendo version, like I did, they were replaced with less violent finishing moves. This was due to Nintendo's family friendly policy which forced Midway to also change the blood to sweat. A couple of the fatalities, I think I just made that up, left in the game are still violent, although their supernatural themes probably gave them a free pass. I guess Nintendo back in the day figured it unlikely that any kids playing this game would attempt to rip his own face off down to the boat in order to spew fire at his enemies. How wrong they were. However, even with all the great memories I have of this game and playing it with my brother, cousins and friends, going back to it for this feature left me with a sour taste in my mouth. Visually, it still holds up with my memories, but gameplay-wise I was mostly left frustrated by it. The difficulty of the AI characters could transition from borderline stupid to virtually unbeatable within the same match. Even with experimenting with different difficulties, many a match would just be over the moment the CPU started bashing the high punch button when your back was at the outer edge of the arena, keeping you in a stun lock animation until your health bar went from completely full to completely empty over the course of just a few seconds. That being said though, Mortal Kombat is still a series that I hold dear. Over the last few years it's been going through somewhat of a renaissance, with a much needed reboot in 2011, a great two season web series in Mortal Kombat Legacy, and Mortal Kombat X in 2015. Series creator, and still very much in charge, Ed Boon, is a man that I have a great deal of respect and I look forward to what we can expect from him and his talented team in the future. So Ed, if you're listening, whoever wrote Johnny Cage's quips for Mortal Kombat X needs a raise. It's game over, man! Go back to your hive and vomit out a room you can cry in. Keep your big mouth and your little mouth shut. You know your head looks like a dildo. What's that on your face? Oh! I know Halloween stores that have much better masks. You ready to face off? That's just really fucked up, man. Oh, look, a robot. Earthwell's Cloud. Is it mechanically possible for you to fuck yourself? That's it for this visit to the Video Game Shoebox, but be sure to tune in next time for another step down memory lane as I dust off some more cartridges. Be sure to let me know on Twitter any games from your childhood you'd like to see on here. I've been Mike Nottridge, and I'll see you next time. And that's about it for this edition of Player Attack. Thanks for watching. Next week, we're off to Oz Comic Con in Adelaide, and you never know just who we might run into while we're there. In the meantime, you can catch us at playerattack.com. We're on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And if you've got something you want to say, send us an email, mailbox at playerattack.com, or just hop on our forums. Till next week, I'm Jessica Citizen, and this is Player Attack.